Hi everyone, welcome back to Robert Lipschitz's second talk on the spectrification of Kavana homology. Um, we're very excited to have him here and yeah, please Robert, take it away. Thanks, um, it's very nice to be back here um, virtually. The, um, I don't mind being interrupted. So if you have questions, please interrupt. Um, so let me just briefly recall where we were and then I'll tell you the plan for this talk. So um, our goal was this uh, stable homotopy refinement of Kavanaugh homology. Um, and uh, we had that as a few steps. So we had uh, this cube category two, which was um, two objects and one morphism between them. And um, we were constructing a map from functor from two to the n. So that's just this category taken, you know, times itself n times to the Burnside category of the trivial group, Burnside two category. So this had objects, uh, finite sets, uh, morphisms um, were correspondences, finite correspondences, uh, which is the same as saying matrices of sets. And two morphisms are bijections of correspondences or um, uh, sets of bijections, sorry, matrices of bijections. Um, and then we talked about a couple of ways to um, get a, that there's a functor from the Burnside category to spectra or spaces, CW complexes or spectra. Um, one that's gonna come up, so we, I gave first a um, sketchy explanation in terms of invert, the fact that product and coproduct are the same in spectra. And then we gave a more down to earth explanation by um, uh, Pontryag and Tom-like construction. So um, that's gonna come up again later. So maybe I'll just remind you that we had a Pontryag and Tom-like construction by um, basically you embed the correspondences, embedding the correspondences in spheres and then doing a uh, Pontryag and Tom collapse map. Um, so the second arrow I claim we've understood and the first arrow is what we're gonna do next. So this is uh, part one of the talk. Um, I think that the timing will work that after part one, we have a pause. So I'm planning to do, I'm hoping to get through that and then pause. And then after that, we'll talk briefly about why the, how you prove the results are not invariant um, just in case you're interested in doing something similar that turns out to be um, easy or relatively easy. Um, I want to connect this to um, uh, the earlier construction we gave. So just a brief sketch of the connection there in terms of flow categories uh, slash the cohen jones siegel construction. Um, slash uh, chain complexes of spaces. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about computations. Uh, I think we'll be about out of time at that point. And then with the remaining negative amounts of time, maybe I'll talk a little bit about fun functoriality. But again, I'm sure we'll be out of time by then. So that's just wishful thinking. Um, OK, let's do it. Questions about where we're going? Oh yeah, and this, this notebook, as you might see in the chat, this notebook is available to open. So if you want to go, there's Melissa posting again, perfect. There, there, if you want to go back to see what we already said or it's the previous thing that I've written, you can do that. Okay, onwards. Um, so um, I pre-route a little bit here it's annoying if you're taking notes, but again, you have the notebook. Um, so uh, I want to talk about what's involved in constructing this functor. So we have some knot diagram. This has n equals two crossings. This is the hop link. I'm also going to look in a second at a different one, 
which has also n equals two crossings uh, as an unlink. Um, so I'm supposed to produce from that a, a functor from two to the two to uh, the Burnside category. Um, that is, I should produce a square in the Burnside category. So um, on vertices, um, for each vertex, so here are the four vertices um, written over there, um, there's a corresponding resolution of the link uh, K. So um, F of a vertex V, V is um, vertex in the cube, is the set of um, generators, there's a canonical generating set for the Khavanov complex um, that lie over V. That's the same as saying it's the way of, uh, so it's a set of labelings of the resolution of the circles in the resolution KV by um, my notation, at least here for the um, Frobenius algebra underlying this is generated by one and x. The Frobenius algebra that we, you know, the Kavanaugh formula is defined using a z bracket is x one x squared. Um, okay, uh, so that's what we do on vertices. Um, on edges, um, so I look at whether one generator um, appears in the differential or another. So if um, y is a term in the differential of x, um, then the matrix entry is a singleton set. And otherwise, um, it's empty. So let me show you that what I mean in this example. Um, before I do that, just so that people don't like get angry at me and tune out. Um, so far, this data is completely contained in the in the Kavanov complex. I haven't. There's gonna, there's no new data on the screen yet. There will be some new data in a minute. So what I'm saying is not what I'm going to say is not trivial. What I've said so far is trivial. You know, or is not trivial, but is like not new. So let's look at that in this example. So um, here I have written out, there are two gen, let's take the zero one vertex. There are two generators in the corresponding uh, Kavanov, in the com, uh, Kavanov's corresponding version of the Kavanov cube. So you can label that circle by one or by X. Um, so great. Um, uh, keep going, Robert. Uh, here, there are four generators, uh, one tensor one, one tensor x, x tensor one, and x tensor x. So those are written there. Um, there's a, I'm, Kovanov homology is a cohomology of the space I'm producing. That's this annoying um, dual thing that came up last time that'll be useful when we get to computations or at least convenient. So in the Kovanov differential, x goes to x tensor x and one goes to one tensor x plus x tensor one. There's the, that arrow. The corresponding arrow because of this dualizing in the cube in the Burnside category goes the other direction. And here are the matrix entries. So the fact that x went to x tensor x is corresponding to, let me highlight that. This is corresponding to this entry C here because this C is X tensor X going to X. Okay, it's just a singleton set, remembering that the coefficient here was one. Um, the A and the B, oh, I can probably do different colors. Look at that. The um, A is coming from the fact that uh, one tensor X shows up in the differential of one. Um, okay, and again, this is just a repackaging of the differential on the Kavanov complex. There's nothing new here. Um, a functor, however, is not just, you don't just have a map associated to each edge. You also have a map going diagonally because, you know, in the cube going over and then down is the same as going down and then over. Okay. So let's think about what that map going diagonally is supposed to be. Um, the map going diagonally on the one hand should agree with going over and then down. 
it should also give you going down and then over. Well, um, over and then down means I take these two matrices, the over matrix and the down matrix, and I multiply them. So um, God help me, I did that. It's here. There's the, the product of those two matrices. Um, remember, the way you multiply matrices uses the disjoint union and the product of sets. Um, this matrix still has either zero or one entries in every element, in, in every, sorry, matrix entry. Every term in the matrix, every entry has either zero or one entries. The labels the entries are funny because it's like BG is one entry there. Um, if I go down and then over, I get a very similar looking uh, matrix with slightly different entries. Um, I mean, it's essentially the same matrix. It's just the entries have been labeled differently. There's an obvious bijection between these two correspondences because every entry in the matrix either has zero, zero elements or one element. And so um, uh, it's, what did my, uh, Shushu had a clever way of saying this, but it's trivial to identify the empty set with the empty set. There's only one way to do that. And there's only one way to identify the one element set with the one element set. So this bijection, there's a unique one and there's no choice. And again, I've not actually produced any, there's no extra information in choosing it, but I have to choose that for each face. Again, in this case, completely determined by the Kovanov complex. But um, this is the data that I need in order to construct a functor from the cube to the Burnside category, this cube in the Burnside category. Then there's some check across three-dimensional cubes that I'm going to suppress. So I need to check something, dot, 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 check something across three cubes. I'm going to give that as an exercise in a few minutes. Uh, okay. Let me look at the second example because the second example, something a little bit interesting happens. Okay. So different two crossing link. Um, it's the unlink with this particular diagram. Okay, cube of resolutions looks like this. And the corresponding square in the Burnside category is written out here. Um, whoops. So it's written here. Um, again, the matrices associated the edges are completely determined by the uh, differential of the complex. Um, uh, great. Um, but now when I multiply these matrices, so if I go over and down, I get this, this is an upper triangle, strictly upper triangular two by two matrix of sets. Sort of coincidence that it's upper triangular. But the top right corner, this the top right corner, I can do highlighting, I'm really enjoying my highlighter. The top right corner is now a two element set. And when I go down and over the bottom, sorry, the top right corner there is a two element set. And now there are two ways to identify across the face. So I need some way of choosing in order to get a lax functor from the Burnside, sorry, from the cube to the Burnside category, lax two functor. I need to identify these two compositions. Okay, so I, the extra data, so I need um, one extra piece of data. Um, how to identify um, the uh, matrix entries for going over and going down versus going down and going over. Okay. And that's a Z mod two's worth of a non canonical Z mod two's worth of entries, one bit of data. Okay. Um, I can't choose just anything because there's a compatibility condition across three cubes. So I have to identify them well so, so that that compatibility condition is satisfied. Um, also, eventually we want to have a not invariant, but that's far down the road. Um, I think that's all for what I've pre route So um, how am I going to do that? Um, so the 
extra data beyond the um, the extra data that we need, data we need, is um, how to identify these matrix entries across faces. Um, and um, okay, if the entry is the empty set or a singleton, um, that's trivial. I mean, there's a unique um, there's a unique way of identifying. Um, and it turns out there's only one other case. So the remaining case um, always looks like the picture that I just that I drew up here. So the remaining case looks as follows. Um, so uh, we like to draw it somehow this way. So you have in the um, zero, zero resolution, there's some uh, circle and it goes back to being a circle in the one, one resolution. So the way that that looks up to isotopy in S2, I guess, is always like this. So um, I can do this. So there's zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. And now the two matrix entries um, are the following. Um, so the, ah, there's more. What's more, um, this entry has to be one. This, the, the labeling there and the labeling there has to be X. That's the upper triangular thing we saw in the first, in the, that's this being upper triangular in the example. This is exactly what the example looked like. Um, the example is the minimal example where this happens. Um, the two corresponding entries are, the matrix entries are essentially identified with the two intermediate generators. So there's a generator here, one tensor X and a generator X tensor one. And there's a generator here, one tensor X and a generator X tensor one. Um, and the two, I mean, the the, path, the matrix entries are you go there and over, or you go there and over, or you go there and over, or you go there and over. And I need to identify the these pairs. It's like the, the thing that we're writing down is a cancellation rule. It's saying, okay, we know that there's a bijection because d squared is zero in the complex. And what we're writing down is a particular choice of why d squared equals zero. We're writing down this bijection witnesses the fact that d squared equals zero. Um, great. And you know, there's a the way I wrote it, it looks like there's an obvious way to identify one tensor x gets identified one tensor x, but I didn't tell you which label, I mean one tensor x, which was labeled one and which was labeled x. So I need to be able to pick out, you know, some sort of an ordering. So here's how you do it. If you go along one of these red arcs, these red arcs correspond to the crossings that are being changed. The red arcs are the crossings. So you go along one of the red arcs and you turn right. You either end up at this edge, if you go along this and you, that way and turn right, or if you go along this one and you turn right, you end up on the same edge, the edge I labeled one, or you, let me just call it something other than one, let's call it E or you end up on this edge E prime if you walked downwards instead of upwards and you turned right. Okay. The plane has an orientation. I'm using the orientation of the plane, R2. Um, and now, um, so that's picked out a distinguished pair of the four edges. That picks out a pair of, a pair of, uh, that, so then each of the circles here gets labeled either E or E prime. So this is the circle E and this is the circle E prime. 
And in this picture, this is the circle E and this is the circle E prime because each, you know, one, these edges each are contained in one of the two circles. And the identification is that the, um, if this labels, so let's say that the first entry here was labeling E and the second was labeling E prime. And the first here is labeling E and the second is labeling E prime. This is how I'm gonna write down the generator. Then the identification um, is the obvious one. So I identify it by saying that the label of the circle E is identified with the label circle, circle E, like label of circle E. Okay, once I've, once I've paired up the two circles in the two resolutions, I'm just gonna keep beating this horse. Once I pair up the circles in the one zero resolution, the circles in the zero one resolution, I've paired up the generators and that's what I needed for my cancellation rule. So that's what I, that's the data. Um, okay. Um, uh, we call this a ladybug configuration because for whatever reason it looks to us like a ladybug. Um, and then um, we have a two-part exercise. Um, one, um, uh, show that um, there's an ex a condition to check Um, for each three cube um, uh, for this definition. I've already, uh, so I've already, I've defined this only for the map associated edges and that go across faces. I really supposed to have a map from any higher vertex, any lower vertex, that should be well defined. So it's like, I'm just gonna check on each three cube for this definition to uh, extend to a wax two functor from the cube to the Burnside category. Um, you guys should be annoyed with me. So let me let me clear out that annoyance. Um, the cube I didn't define as a two category. The cube is a two category with only identity two morphisms. That's a very natural thing to do. And it's a natural thing to talk about. I mean, lacks two functions that to a two categories is a very reasonable thing to think about. Um, asserts Robert. Um, and so check, show there's a particular condition. It, it's somehow a hexagon. So expect a hexagon there. And Ben was explaining why we expect a hexagon there last time. And two, check it. It's some combinatorial case check about how two different crossings can be arranged in a diagram. Um, this ends version one of the definition. I'm gonna give you a, so, the next question, one of the next questions you might be asking is, please, can't you give us a more intrinsic definition of this construct, a more intrinsic construction that doesn't involve this combinatorics and choosing things and so on? So I'm going to answer that in a sec, very briefly. It's going to be unsatisfying. Uh, other questions before I keep going? This is not yet the pause. I'm going to do the other thing and then we'll have the pause. I would move pages, but you can always come back to this page because you have one note open and excellent. No questions. It's totally clear. Perfect. Um, I think I'm just going to read to you the next one. So, um, yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> Let's go back to let's go back to uh, some example. Um, let's even draw the let's do the ladybug. So um, this ladybug corresponds to a carbidism in um, R three uh, in R two cross I. So again, th this picture corresponded to this cube where one circle turned into um, two circles there and two circles here. And then it turned back into one circle uh, here. I don't know, something like that. This is not a very good picture drawing. Um, so each of these crossing changes, of course, corresponds to 
um, a saddle cuboidism. So this is a cuboidism in um, in uh, R2 cross I that goes from one circle to two circles by doing a saddle, and then it goes back to one circle. Um, um, oh, I know what I meant to write up here. Oh, well, too late now. But I think your upper left corner should be nested. You think my upper left corner should be nested? Up, I agree. Up, I believe up, that. Up, up left. Up, OK, up. fine. Yeah. And now this one's looking even worse. Nested sounds good to me. I bet you're right. It should be very good. Um, so, um, uh, I need to associate to each of these. So, goal is I'm going to associate to um, to a carbonism like that a set in a canonical way as opposed to what I was sort of doing before. Um, OK, it's a carbonism like that together with a labeling of the faces, of the circles and the boundary as one or x. You know, we can have some more components to that carbonism if we had, say, another component that wasn't changing. Carbonism could be more complicated. It doesn't have to be just a face. So I'm going to associate to any carbonism like a uh, uh, set. Um, OK. If um, the genus of the carbonism is bigger than 1, or um, the genus is equal to 1, and um, the labels aren't um, 1 at the bottom and x at the top, or um, the genus is equal to zero, and the number of um, x's on the bottom plus the number of ones on the top is not equal to one. Then the set is empty. So then I associate the empty set. That's the cases where the Differential in Kavanaugh homology is zero for like grading kind of reasons because you end up with too many multiplications in the Frobenius algebra or something. You know, x times x times x times x is zero. In fact, x times x is zero. That's one of these cases. Um, Co-product of, I mean, whatever. Um, okay, um, if the genus is zero, um, and I'm not in the case there, the set has one element. And again, it doesn't matter which, I mean, like there's only one empty set. So it doesn't matter which empty set I associate. It doesn't matter which one element set I associate because there are no automorphisms of a one element set. So these cases are not interesting. And it does, again, it's just any one element set will do. The remaining case is the case drawn here where there's a two element set and, uh, sorry, there's going, to, there's going to have to be a two element set as we saw before. That's where the genus is one and the labelings are so that the cancellation is this sort of complicated, not very complicated, but a little bit complicated thing with matching up across face. So here's the um, set that you associate. This is from our, one of our papers. Um, decompose S2 cross zero one is the union of two compact three manifolds glued along sigma. Let's just uh, have that some the local piece of this picture again. Um, so uh, two compact submanifolds glued along sigma. Maybe A will be the outside and B will be the inside of sigma. It's like you took a checkerboard co coloring. Um, so the set we're going to have is a set of unordered bases for the kernel of the map of the map from H1 of sigma to H1 of boundary sigma. OK, kernel of the map from H1 of sigma to H1 of boundary sigma. That is, um, uh, we have these two circles generate the kernel. OK, but I need to orient them. But those two circles with the orientations generate the kernel. Um, 
So that alpha is a restriction of the H1 of the, sorry, the point grade dual. So let's generate the kernel, fine. Alpha is a restriction of generator of the kernel of H1 of A to H1 of um, A intersect the boundary. Uh, that's this red circle. So the red circle is alpha because that's the one that comes from H1 of the, of the outside of the A part. And the green circle is the corresponding beta. So that's coming from H, that's coming from the homology of B. And so that if we orient sigma as the boundary of A, then uh, their intersection number is one. So um, unfortunately that's the inward pointing normal orientation and um, uh, that induces something, it's something like that. So um, there's a canonical two element set associated with cavoidism. It's bases, basically bases for H1 of the surface not quite because this um, the boundary could be complicated, but H1 of the surface when you cap off the boundary um, coming from bases for A and bases for H1 of A and H1 of B. Okay, what do I need to tell you about this? I need to tell you how to compose, how these sets compose. Sorry, Robert, so what are the two bases? So the one you drew and the reverse? And the one, the yeah, the one I drew and the one with both orientations reversed. Nothing else works. Nothing, Nothing else, else works. Completely. That's right. Those are the only two bases that satisfy this condition, these conditions. Yeah. This is one of us. We write this down. There are a bunch of ways to write this down, but this is one. Um, and then I need to explain how if I compose. So the interesting thing to do for these two isomorphisms is the case that you um, compose two genus zero surfaces and you get a genus one surface. And so we wrote it down. Um, how does that work? So I'll say it briefly-ish. Um, if I compose two genus one surfaces to get a genus two, sorry, genus zero surfaces to get a genus one surface, that look, looks like this. Dry the middle set of level doesn't help. Um, in each of the compositions, exactly one of the circles at the middle level is labeled one, and all the others are labeled x. At the bottom, we had a one, at the top, we had an x. And the point is that the circle labeled one gives us a way of choosing which basis we take. So you orient the circle labeled one with the orientation induced from the bottom half, if I remember right. And then that circle labeled one either comes from the A region or B region. In this case, it comes from the A region that was out here. And so you take that as your basis element coming from A and then that determines the whole thing. So um, the point is you, you have a, your distinguished circle coming from which was labeled one in the, in the map determines the, this choice of basis. Okay, dot, dot, dot. Um, I find this not somehow less, even though it's more canonical, I find this less illuminating than what happened than the combinatorics. Um, maybe there's a nice, really nice way to say this that I haven't found yet. And it explains why this is a reasonable construction. But, and if you find it, tell me. We have several different not so nice versions, but this is the nicest of our not so nice versions. Great, I propose that this is where we insert the, the break. Very well, in that case, uh, let's take a small five minute break. And then of course, everybody's free to go, except for Robert, he's still here on the hot seat. You may all ask him as many questions as you'd like. <laughs> Robert, so I didn't get the last part. So is there any form way of describing um, how a thing works, work in the language on embedded surfaces to naturally arrive at this construction with a torus with one and x circles at the top and bottom? Oh, sorry. Um, so, so this is right. So what I'm saying here is that um, if I had a, this, this, come on, Robert. Um, this part here, this is like a matrix entry. This is a matrix entry in the 
in the map going um, that away. So I have a little, I we're looking at a face and say, and we're, this is, this is what I've drawn is a matrix entry here. And I need to, and I'm composing it with a matrix entry there. That's the, the top piece. And I need to explain how does that correspond to something, the diagonal map, which is up here. So I need to explain how do you, how, what's the, bi, what's the, the canonical bijection between going over and down versus going diagonally. And the answer is you take this matrix entry, which, which is the data drawn here. Um, that data singles out one of the circles in the surface. And then you use the orientation, I think we said of the bottom half to orient that circle and take that to be part of your basis. Yeah, 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 I think I understand now. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. And this also works when the circles are nested. This also, this works, also in works in the circles are nested. It's just not as easy to draw the picture. Yeah. More questions while we're breaking. And, and so some things break down if you just try, if you forget about embedding, if you just look at Two decabordisms, a re of two decabordisms, or something right. breaks down. Yeah, everything breaks down. That's a good question. Um, so, for this intrinsic description, the embedding is built into the definition of what the generators, picking out these two canonical, gener the canonical generators for H1. Um, for the other description, um, if you just have, if you have this abstract circle, I'd use the fact that we were turning right in order to pick out two of the arcs. If I just reflect the circle, that's a homeomorphism of the whole picture. It just doesn't preserve the orientation of the plane. Then that exchange is going right and going left. So you lose so you that. the orientation of the plane to know how to turn right. That's right. I need the orientation. Well, I that's correct. Orientation, I need the orientation. orientation of the plane. That's right. That's right. Orientation. Okay, I think it's orientation. Uh, I mean, orientation. Yeah, I, normal. Just normal direction to the plane. Is I think that's. Normal. I'm unable to answer that question because you have a plane in R three and you have a co-orientation. You have an orientation. So like, I, I'm using the orientation of the plane because because the orientation says you that right is that way. I possibly. Now that I'm writing it, I get no, but I think if, you, if only if you don't, if S3 is only oriented, then I think it's still, it's enough to just have orientation to, to know how to turn. Fair but enough. That's, not, that's a minor thing that doesn't matter. I'm, not, I'm, you know. Yeah, you know, contact topologists always talk about co-oriented contact structures, but like they mostly only talk about orientable manifolds. So like, it's, I don't know. I'm, me also occurs to me that I was turning left when I was telling you I was turning right on the previous slide, I think. So that's a little bit sad. Um, we would have to go back and check. Let's not check. We'll pretend I was turning right. That's the hard part of the talk is knowing right from left. More questions. Shall we soldier on? Uh, Nicole, I think you're muted. Let's maybe give it a little bit, uh, one more minute and then. That sounds good. Great. Can I quick ask a quick question about terminology, Robert? Do you want to go back up to the ladybug picture? Uh, yeah, here. Right. Or the, uh, the previous uh, one. The, the previous one, I, I like better. You bet. Uh... Right. Okay. So if the picture on the left is called the ladybug, I just wanted to know your terminology for the headphones, the curling iron, and the kidneys. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> right. It's an interesting collection of real world objects that show up in this cube. Um, I just can't think of a good one for the ellipse. So. Ah, sorry. Potato. Headphone. The headphones indeed the look potato. like headphones. Why a ladybug is turning into headphones, I can't really explain, but maybe that's the next Apple product or something. 
<laughs> all right, all right. The questions have now gotten in ridiculous enough that we should probably continue. Uh, yes. In that case, please, Robert, take it away. Will do. Um, remind me when I stop. I stop at 11, is that right? And then there's some more questions. Yeah, that's that's good. Great. Okay. I mean, I can go on forever. So like you, you, uh, yeah. you all need to lay down the law. Okay, 11 it is. Um, uh, I want to say a few words about invariance. So the moral here is that it's easy. Um, so the theorem is that if um, L and L prime differ by a Reidemeister move. Um, then um, the space associated to L is um, stably homotopy equivalent to the space associated to L prime. So this means um, stably homotopy equivalent, which means homotopy equivalent after doing some number of suspensions if we're doing spaces. So you can suspend them both some number of times so they become homotopy equivalent. Um, so um, ingredients. Okay, the key ingredient is the Whitehead's theorem, which um, um, I shall remind you of. Uh, if um, f from x to x prime is a continuous map such that um, the induced map on homology is an isomorphism, then f is a homotopy, is a stable homotopy equivalence. I mean, as long as X was simply connected, F is in fact a homotopy equivalence. So since we're suspending, it all becomes simply connected. Um, okay, there's um, Mikhail's proof of invariance for um, Kavanov homology. Kavanov homology is an invariant. Um, so uh, I just need to construct um, maps of spaces um, inducing um, inducing the usual invariance maps on homology. Okay, the same is true for cohomology, homology or cohomology. Oops. And usually invariance maps on cohomology. Okay, so I just need to show that the usual maps on the Kavanov complex are covered by maps of spaces, and then we're done. Um, and so uh, one easy way to get um, uh, maps of spaces, easy way to get maps of spaces is um, Ute is by um, inclusions of subcomplexes, right? These are CW complexes. So CW complexes, cellular, you know, uh, or quotients by CW subcomplexes. Um, and fortuitously, the way that the Kovanov invariance maps are mostly defined is by doing a sequence of inclusions and quotients of subcomplexes. So um, that's sub chain complexes, but we just see that those correspond to sub. Um, so see that the inclusions and quotients in the usual proof. Correspond to um, inclusions and quotients of sub to uh, sub CW complexes or quotient CW complexes. And it's easy to write down conditions on a functor to the Burnside categories to get a sub 
complex, you need some subset of the objects and some subset of, I mean, subset of the vertices and some so that the corresponding matrices, something or other. Um, we called it a, I think, insular subfunctor, or maybe we called it a, maybe it was an insular subfunctor. Okay. Um, I think that's all I want to say about invariance. But the main point here was that it's a, it's not so hard to prove invariance if you have a reasonable construction of the thing, because Whitehead's theorem says you just need to find the maps, and finding maps is not so hard if you if the original maps were defined in a fairly simple way. I'm going to keep going. The construction I gave you is not our original construction of the uh, Kavanov stable homotopy type. So let me tell you a few words about the original one. Um, the reason I want to do this is because this is probably this, if what you're interested in finding homotopy refinements of other stuff, the original construction is much more flexible. And so this probably helps. Um, to understand it, um, um, we should remember, by the way, I'm not going to make it to like anything that convinces you that this construction is interesting. The assumption, the my understanding was there'd been previous talks by Schutzer at other places, which like gave up some applications and computation, a little bit of computation assertions and stuff. So I apologize for not convincing you in these talks that what that there's any reason to listen to me. Um, I feel kind of bad about that. Sorry, it's not a trivial construction. I'll just say something. This is not interesting, but there are knots with isomorphic Kavanaugh homology and non-homotopy equivalence uh, Kavanaugh homotopy types. So in spite of the fact that it looks so close to the, just the homology kind of construction, there's actually more information here. Um, those original computations you'd have caught in the seed. Um, OK, let's talk about the about flow category. So recall, um, given um, a cube, in the Burnside category, um, we got a space by doing, by this uh, Pontryag and Tom-like construction. So let's, um, let's, so just consider the case n equals one for a second. So I have some, uh, so a cube there is I have some set, let's, I don't know, a, B, and some other, and some other set, I don't know, uh, C, D, let's make this, put three in this, A, B, C, D, E, and we had some correspondence. Um, this is the same as a matrix of sets. So um, those are both going to C apparently, and this one's going to A, and over here, let's say this one is going to D, and this one is going to D, and this one is going to E. Okay, so here's a, here's a, uh, a set and uh, another set and a correspondence between them. So this is the right data for a map in the, in the Burnside, you know, functor for the n equals one case. So what did we do? We um, took a collection of spheres associated to um, the uh, source. So this is a sphere labeled A, a sphere labeled B, and a sphere labeled C. This is just uh, wedge sum over X in uh, S. So here we have a correspond A from S to T of a sphere, some big dimension. Um, let me label these. Let's call this X, Y, and Z. I embedded the correspondence into this, this collection of spheres. So um, I embedded uh, X and Y into C and Z into A, because that's what the picture was saying. I have another collection of spheres, uh, D and E. Th these are here I'm thinking mod boundary. So I'm drawing them as disks, by the way. I'm thinking of it as disk sphere as a disk mod boundary. And what we did is we um, took a collapse map. So we took a little neighborhood of X, Y, and Z. And I collapsed everything outside it to a point. 
Um, so everything outside those little neighborhoods goes to a point. So that gives me a map to um, to uh, z x um, y mod boundary. And then I just mapped this by mapping, okay, x was going to e. So I just mapped the identity map there. And um, y and z were going to d. So I take the identity map there. Okay. Um, so that's that was we talked about the last time. This is sort of a special case of what we talked about last time there. Um, and then if we had a face, um, I would have had a family of embeddings rather than a single one. So um, I had maybe Z um, and Z prime, depending on whether I went along the face this way or that way. And we fixed a path between them. And that induced a homotopy of math map. So path of embeddings gives us a homotopy of maps, et cetera. Um, I want to generalize this. Um, uh, Generalization. Um, so where before we had a um, finite set, this was an, the object in the Burnside category, I'm going to generalize that to a framed zero manifold. It's just a disjoint union of points with signs, but it's a a frame zero manifold. And then the same construction gives us a Pontryag and Tom collapse map. So if I have a, instead of correspondence of finite sets, I've got correspondences of, okay, it's just signed finite sets, but framed finite sets. But then I can do more general cancellation. So instead of um, paths of embeddings, Um, I'm instead going to have a framed one manifold with boundary. So this red arc I've drawn, that's this path from Z to Z prime, I'm replacing by a framed one manifold with boundary. So in particular, I could now have a, I don't know how to draw a framed circle. There's a framed circle. I could now have a framed circle instead. Of, you know, I have closed components um, things don't have to go across the cube. They can come back to the same to the same side of the face, um, etc. So instead of a two-parameter uh, family of embeddings, uh, you get will replace that by a framed two-manifold with corners. Um, and again, the, the combinatorics of the corner structure has to correspond to what's going on with the finite sets and the framed one manifold. So it's it's just like this this um, realis this way of realizing the function that we talked about before, except that I'm now not in this little sub piece of the Pontryagin and Tom construction. Where everything is framed in a specific way. Now things to be framed more generally, and then you still get a map to spaces. Um, So if you encode this, this turns into, so short time. So roughly, um, if you'd figure out um, what this means, so if you think about the meaning uh, this, you'll get to the notion of what's called a framed flow category. This is a notion that was introduced by Cohen, Jones, Siegel. The reason it's called a flow category is if you have a Morse function on a manifold, you get the same sort of data that you're writing down here. Um, and this is more flexible in a couple of ways. You don't need to have a cube. You can just talk about chain complexes of spaces. So these correspond to 
um, chain complexes of spaces, uh, you know, of spheres. What the hell is a chain complex of spheres? Um, it's a sequence of spaces, which are say wedges of spheres. Let's make it go this way, x1, x2. So this is a wedge sum of spheres, and this is a wedge sum of spheres, and this is a wedge sum of spheres. They're all the same dimensional sphere, but some big dimension, say, I don't know, empty. Um, so that if you go over twice, so this composition is null homotopic. And if you go, you know, and, and uh, this composition is null homotopic, but not just the null homotopy exists. There's, you've got a chosen null homotopy of each composition. And then there's some, there's some compatibility condition here that if you think about, you'll figure out and so on. And so there's a, here there's a null homotopy of null homotopies associated to length, what is that length three paths and so on. Um, and these are in bijection of these free and flow categories. So there's a general, a general-ish version of the can you find a homotopy refinement for question is, I see I'm dissolving into my into the background. Um, a general part of the uh, general version is given a chain complex of abelian groups, can you find a chain complex of spaces, chain complex of spaces realizing it? And this writing down a frame flow category is um, a way you can do that. It's an equivalent. Uh, construction, but sometimes more concrete. Um, a frame flow category consists of a cancellation, you know, a complex and a cancellation rule for d squared and then higher cancellation rules. Um, maybe one last word in case people are actually identifying this stuff. Um, it's interesting to construct, um, to construct just even if you can't construct a whole space, just xn plus three mod xn. So what is that? That's um, three consecutive layers in a CW complex. The n, that's the n plus one skeleton, the n plus two skeleton, the n plus three skeleton. I know that's not, maybe I should write xn plus two mod xn minus one. It's the n skeleton, n plus one skeleton, and n plus two skeleton. Um, so it's already interesting to do that because this gives you, because um, you get, an operation SQ2 from this. So you get a, already the first interesting cohomology operation. And if that's all you want to construct, then you don't have to construct a whole frame flow category or a whole complex of space. You just have to construct the three adjacent terms. So you need, all you need there is a cancellation rule. And if you construct this, you can ask, you can then ask, does there exist um, an Xn plus three? And an abstraction to that is the first of the ADEM relations. So um, the first ADEM relation gives you a, a thing to check there. Um, so um, there, what you so there you need to check some compatibility condition for your cancellation rule to see whether that works. So if that's how this whole project with shoot treats started, actually, now it's a long time ago, was we. Um, thought we have no idea how to construct a stable homotopy or find of Kavana homology. And we also have no idea whether it would be interesting, whether it'd give new information. But we thought, okay, well, we'll just try to construct an operation square two by constructing this information and then check the dem relation and do some computation to see if it was interesting. Okay, in the process, Schuchard had a great idea that, that let us construct the whole space. But by the time we'd gotten there, we'd already done computations to see whether what we were getting were was interesting, which, which was encouragement to keep going. So, um, so I don't know, that strategy of just trying to construct a few stages first worked for us. So I'm pushing it, I'm advocating it for you. Um, I think I'm out of time. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Robert. Does anyone have any questions for our speaker? Uh, 
Robert, so in, in your kind of construction of embedded surfaces in three space, I mean, you can probably choose some framing that is that doesn't be related to the frame category, frame floor category you just mentioned. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, not as far as I know, although, um, so in the case that I'm telling you about, we have a function of the Burnside category, all of the higher stuff in the frame flow category is simple. You have all these, you have a bunch of manifolds with corners that turns out that the right things to choose are permutahedra. So they turn out to be permutahedra and the framings you can construct by some abstraction theory or maybe there's a canonical way to get them. So it's a little bit, so I don't know the answer to your question, but it, it has a little bit of a sort of staring at tea leaves feel to it because like, um, it's sort of like asking is this very specific concrete thing related to this concrete, this specific concrete thing. And, you know, you can always find some relation or not find a relation. But. Maybe another question. And can you do, do you have more examples of this TQFT like functors from say some version of cavordisms into Burnside, into the Burnside category or Burnside two category? That's also a good question. Um, yes and no. Largely the answer is no. Um, going to the Burnside category puts some strong restriction on what functors you can look at because you just don't, you can't have any signs. There can be no minus signs in the multiplication or co-multiplication. But this more general looking at a frame flow category, then you can have minus signs. You have negatively framed points. So it's might be easier to find ones there. Okay, sorry, no, I have three quick comments. Two, um, it wasn't a functor from an abstract TQF, like abstract COVIDism category to the Burnside category. It was important that they were embedded in, that they were embedded COVIDisms. Yeah. And the only other example I know is not quite that, but there's a refinement of odd Kavana homology by um, uh, Schuchrid and uh, Matt Stoffergen and Chris Caduto um, that, um, so there they use a slightly different chunk of the frame, uh, of the, of the frame coverism category where they have positively framed and negatively framed points, but they have no cancellation between them. So um, the code doesn't either connect positive point to positive point across at face, or they connect negative point to negative point across a face. So that again, avoids having to think about higher coherences. But the short answer to your, to your question is no, I don't have any more examples and that's an embarrassment. Yes, yeah, so it's a good problem to find more examples. That would be great. You also can play where you can take you can weaken the target category. I maybe said this last time, maybe I said it just in, in, in an email or, or in uh, chatting at the end, but you can, instead of the Burnside category, instead of the frame flow category, you could look at, um, you could look at spin cobordisms or oriented cobordisms, oriented is, you know, or uh, spin C cobordisms or whatever. You can put look at some something that's in between, you know, unoriented cobordisms or and all cobordisms, sorry, and frame cobordisms. So um, maybe you can get a refinement somewhere in there. And that again, probably corresponds to having like a refinement that's K theory, but not stable homotopy or that's uh, real K theory, but not stable homotopy. So just pressing to kind of less, yeah, saying so spin cobordisms or just like yeah, cobordisms and you get just less information. That's right. That's right. So if you have le less than framed cobordisms, then it's a the question, it's like uh need to or one of the other experts can correct me, but um it's a question of so um like spin cobordism admits an orientation in complex, sorry, in real K theory and spin C cobordism and it's a, a uh, complex K theory orientation. And that somehow tells you what, that's like what you're getting out of the refinement. Well, I mean, I so some sort of- You're saying that you can, you, can, you can change, you can look at various versions of a frame flow category 
that's one thing. And so maybe I was asking about changing the embedding, the category of embedded surfaces. Not the, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so maybe, so for example, who Krish Krish assert that if you don't take embedded cobordisms, you can still get a refinement to K theory. Um, I haven't understood their construction, which is at least partly a statement about me, but uh, um, maybe it's entirely a statement about me. So I haven't, but I haven't, it would be interesting for somebody to understand that construction. But anyway, the assertion is that even without the embedding, you can get a refinement to K theory. But they want a spin structure. They want some additional data. They, you, yeah, I, I'm worried anything I tell you will be a misreading of their paper, but they work with surfaces with spin structures, but they take, but they only take, so on the boundary circles, they always take what they call the anti-periodic spin structure, which they view as the non-trivial one, but it's the one that bounds. So uh, they look at circles with a particular spin structure, which is the one that bounds a disk. I would call that the trivial one, but you know, anyway. Um, and then there's surfaces, there's also some condition on the spin structure. So, um, I'm not. I'm not sure whether it's actually extra data or whether it's determined by the topology. Maybe I'll ask you later. Yeah, that's. May I make a statement? This is Nitu here. Just yeah, please. Very brief statement. Um, uh, this is a very general statement. It's not. Uh, it's not detailed enough for this particular example. It's just I wanted to say, when one does these Pontryagin Tomsk type constructions, you typically don't get a map from one space or spectrum to another, what you get is a map from one spectrum to a thumb space of another. So what you get is a twisted, um, a map between twisted objects. And, and, and so it comes down to asking when are these twisted objects untwisted? And so if you're working in the framed cobordism category, those uh, objects are untwisted almost by definition of framed. And if you're working with spin, then those uh, twisted objects are twisted by spin bundles. And like Robert was saying, spin bundles are orientable in real K theory. And therefore you can construct a whole complex just like you're seeing on the screen, but in real K theory, but not on the nose. And now if you're working with spin C manifolds, this whole complex, every time you see an X, it's twisted by a bundle um, which is a spin C bundle. And so it's not going to give you a complex like you see, but if you apply a cohomology where those bundles are orientable, then you get a picture just like this because orientation is precisely a construction that turns a twisted bundle into a trivial bundle. So, so this is a very general statement. I think that these whole, when people construct these kinds of Pontryag and Tom pictures, uh, they come with twistings, and those twistings are made trivial in the right cohomology theory. And so framed cobordism is the one where everything is trivial to begin with. So you don't have to trivialize it. That's great. Yeah, that's the explanation that I was reaching for and not, get, not quite getting to. That's perfect. Thanks, Nita. Um, there's, a, there's a paper from the mid 2000s by Ralph Cohen that also spells out the, sort of the details of that, of the, that construction and uh, for arbitrary generalized cohomology theories and what data you need. So, so a reference to, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of other places to read it also, but one reference for what you to say is a paper about um, refining chain complexes by Ralph Cohen from the, the mid 2000s. Um, and yeah, yeah, but that's a beautiful explanation. That was a very nice explanation. That's a great talk. Thank you, by the way, Robert. Thanks very much. I'm, I apologize for my talk. I always feel like they were terrible when I finish. So. I have a question to ask just because of the composition of people in this room. Um, so just stepping away from trying to think of applications like link, you know, you don't want, you know, I don't care about the link diagrams right now, but there are, of course, a lot of situations where you can break down things into other things with positive coefficients, like the representation of finite groups or something. 
um, if I try to fit <laughs> the representation theory of finite groups into the um, Burnside functor um, framework, what kinds of coherences would I check? And then what could this possibly give me? Like, I guess I'm imagining, like, suppose somebody defined a, um, a Havana type of homology using representation of theory of finite groups or something, then we would have been going through this, all of this, but with like positive, sorry, not just elements of size up to two, but like many larger sets. For some reason, I feel like I'm supposed to say something because I'm the speaker, but uh, um, somebody else will say something more intelligent. I think there have been some, there's been some work by pe people, including Nitsu, about refining some represent sort of homotopy type refinements of some representation theory, also in a different direction. There's a paper of um, Krij and two others, Somberg, who Krij Somberg about that. Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly what you're saying. And I'm also, neither is my homotopy theory nor is my representation theory strong enough to, to know exactly what, what people are, what the goal is. But um, I'm supportive of the question. Maybe somebody else has something more interesting to say. I'll mute myself to indicate. I should add here that I think Nitu has tried to explain to me his work and it is it was steep for me. So <laughs> yeah. So Melissa, maybe maybe I could say one word. Um, so I, I think this construction that Robert outlined is somehow very different from from the way I have been thinking about things. Um, so so I think if you want to include equivariance into this picture that Robert outlined, you might want to go through, um, in other words, looking at what I did might not be the right way. But on the other hand, there may be a way to think of equivar the, 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 the equivariant Burnside ring. So, so that is a cohomology theory. So all the constructions like Pontryag and Tom construction and all of those things can be made in, in that context. Um, I don't know how hard the issue of coherence and things like that turn into um, if you try to feed that machine. In other words, what I'm saying is that the, the, the objects that are fed into this um, instruction appear to have equivariant versions, but then the results and theorems might be a completely different animal. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, my intuition is just as good as yours at this point um, as to how subtle this would be in, in the world of equivariant uh, constructions. I'm not, uh, well, thank you for your answer. I think I'm not actually, it's not clear in my mind. Like, it seems like if I say like S, if G is a symmetric group on a finite number of elements, I'm not necessarily asking about like a BG version of this. But maybe I am, maybe I just, it's just not clear to me, but I'm thinking about like, we're really looking at um, a vector space that is one generated by one and X. But if we make that into something more complicated um, as an SN module, is that the same as what you're describing? I mean, in some sense, the objects of this chain complex are, are spectra built out of wedges of spheres, right? Um, oh, okay, so that's the, where the trivial group is showing up. Yeah, that's right. So in, in general, you will, if you were to make this equivariant, you'd end up getting a, a chain complex built out of um, G spectra. Um, and, and so you'd have a chain complex where each term is a, a sort of a stable version of a G representation. Um, right. I think that'll have a lot of structure. I just don't have an intuition for it. Cool. Thank you.
All right. Well, um, I'm going to end the recording because I think uh,